Okay. So um, the answer was the one that most of you got. So it was thought that only stationary cultures, so non-nomadic cultures, could construct monuments, but this nomadic culture was able to organize a workforce to construct a complex of monuments over centuries. That was really what archaeologists learned. They kind of threw what they knew on its head. Um, it is the oldest known earthwork mound complex in North America. And so this would this might be an example of an answer that's at least partially, partially correct here. Um, however, this didn't really change the way archaeologists thought about the hunter-gatherer society. It might have changed what we knew about, you know, the timeline of human occupation in the region, but it didn't change what we thought about hunter-gatherers. So that's why that one is, is not correct. So I will ask questions like this. They're tricky. Um, I'm not going to lie. They're meant, meant to make you think more than a normal multiple choice question. Um, the important part, though, is that I'm giving you all the questions for the exam before the exam happens. So you can study from these. So you can see what I'm going to ask and develop you know, your answer from there. And so even though it's tricky, you're going to have plenty of time to study, plenty of time to think this through outside of the exam period itself. All right, nice job on that. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the mound construction itself. Um, there are some pretty advanced characteristics of these mounds, and um, they kind of show just how much the people in these regions knew about the area. So first of all, mounds were positioned strategically. So you can see um, this image of the Grand Caillou Mound site. These mounds were positioned near streams, natural streams that were used for transportation, hunting, and fishing. And so essentially that's like building near, near a highway that you can get places quickly. Um, they were built on top of natural high areas. And so in this image, all of the red that you see is an area that's on a hillside. And so this would be, for instance, here, a natural levee. And so these mounds were built on top of a natural levee, a natural high area. And this would help them withstand flooding and allow a wide field of view for defense. It's possible that mounds were built um, to seal political alliances for economic exchange region, reasons or for religious ceremonialism. There's not really enough evidence to say um, for sure that many mounds were built for these reasons, but those may also have been important. The mounds were built um, in multiple stages of con construction with sediments of different textures. There was a thick foundation of clay that was actually brought in from offsite. And so this was sediment that was not readily available at the location. And so essentially it was imported from offsite just for the purpose of serving as the foundation. There was a wall of pottery and bone around the rim of the foundation to reinforce the shape. And then the mound itself on top of the foundation was built by layers, by these laminated layers of clay and sand with a thick clay cap. And so this wasn't just a bunch of earth haphazardly piled up. There was a lot of thought put into this. We'll talk about what some of these choices might have done for them. So a reminder as to what sediment is, um, you should have gotten this in Intro to Oceanography, but we'll review it now. Sediment is matter that's broken down by erosion and transported by wind, water, ice, or gravity. So the important part is that this is, this is material like soil that's been moved. There are different grain sizes that you can have in your sediment. Um, coarse sediments that have you know, really large grain size, like for instance, pebbles or gravel, tend to have more pore space or free space between the grains. And so you can see this here, these sediments that are coarser have a lot of this gray area, which is used to represent the pore space in between. And that allows these sediments that are coarser to have better drainage, but they have low stability. So that's why we use gravels on top of, for instance, our gardens, because the water can drain through to the plants, 
but it's not serving as any sort of foundation for a large structure. Fine sediments on this side, like muds or clays, have very little pore space. So you can see there isn't much space in between these grains. Um, but the grains tend to stick together. You can see they fit together like puzzle pieces. So there's more cohesion. And that means there's more stability in you, if you have um, finer sediments, but poor drainage. And so depending on which way you go, you can have different characteristics of the sediments. So you might say if you wanted stability in a mound that you might want to build the entire thing out of fine sediments like clay because then it would be stable, right? Like they, you wouldn't have a whole lot of drainage, but at least it would be stable. Um, so why would we not build the entire mound out of clay? Well, the problem is that clay in this region of the world adsorbs water, which means adsorption, adsor adsorption means adhesion of molecules of liquid or gases onto the surface of a solid particle. And so if you have a clay molecule, it tends to attract and grab onto a bunch of water. You can see how that water grabbing onto the clay can, you know, like get in between the different clay molecules and push them apart. So that means that clays swell when they're wet and they shrink when they're dry. And cracks form. So as they, sh as they swell and shrink, cracks will form in the clay, which weakens the structure. So you saw with the mound that was constructed by the early mound builders that clay was interspersed into the mound material, but it wasn't, the whole thing wasn't made of clay. And so they actually alternated sediments. They had some clay and then maybe a layer of sand and then another layer of clay. And so by alternating sediments with different grain size, what they were able to do is minimize the shrink swell characteristics of the structure. And so there wasn't as much of an impact of the shrinking and the swelling of the clay. They enhanced the drainage. So that way, if there was flooding, that um, that would be able to percolate through the mound and ultimately reduce erosion. And so they were able to maximize strength and maximize drainage without having to give up any sort of um, structural integrity. So. It's a pretty sophisticated way to think about mound building. And sure enough, this is what we do today. So um, if we were to go and build a new levee, like say we wanted to replace one of the levees surrounding the Mississippi River, we went when the, when the river was at a low stage and we decided to construct a new one, we would lay down a foundation of clay. We would build this mound of layers of sediment with different characteristics like topsoil, a sand core. We would produce some sort of cap that would reduce erosion. We could use clay or in this image here, um, what they're using is a uh, sod. So they're using plants to resist erosion. And we would reinforce with hard structures like concrete. And so you can see in this Im image here that this levee is reinforced with a concrete wall. And as I mentioned, the early mound builders would reinforce their structures with um, shell material that formed a wall around the outside. So mound building cultures were already doing this in 400 AD, which is pretty impressive. They were likely highly skilled at engineering earthworks that were able to stand up to the region's unique climate for thousands of years because these structures are still around. All right, any questions about mound building? I want to move on briefly into um, trying to understand a few of the Gulf tribes. And so there, um, there have been a number of different tribes that are slightly more modern. So we have these, um, these mound builders that over time have produced these complex societies. And then eventually there are a whole bunch of tribes that derive from these mound builders. Um, so these would be the tribes that existed before, uh, before colonial occupation of the region. Um, these tribes have inhabited the Gulf of Mexico region both historically and today. Um, they're descendants of the prehistoric mound building cultures, and many of these tribes were mound builders themselves. 
There are a few that are recognized by the U.S. Bureau, Bureau of Indian Affairs, but not all of them, and honestly, not many of these are recognized. And most of them do not exist in the land that was historically theirs because they were um, forced through the Trail of Tears to migrate to the West. And so we have very few remnants of these tribes that remain in the region. These image, images here are showing you the names of the tribes that um, used to occupy all of these areas in Texas. We have here Louisiana, and then here we have um, the Panhandle in Florida. So I'm not gonna be able to go over all these tribes. So what I've done is I've assigned each of you um, one of these tribes that you can go over as a group and learn a little bit more about. So under your assigned material for today for your in-class assignments, each of you should have a um, page assignment that's, that's yours that um, gives you one of these tribes. You're gonna have around four to five people in each group um, to do this work but the work will be your own so you want to make sure you answer the questions what i want to ask you is how much did these cultures depend on the gulf you're going to do a little research on one of these tribes i've included a link in each of these pages um, you're going to discuss in a discussion forum on this page so you have you know a little back and forth with your group members you can share what you found interesting and then you're going to see where you think that this tribe falls on a gradient from completely sea seafaring, so these would be folks like Vikings or like um, ancient Polynesians that really like lived on boats essentially. So that would be one extreme and then all the way to far removed from the coast in the mountains would be the other extreme. So I want you to choose somewhere on this gradient um, and you're not expected to know this information for the exam. This is just some a way to um, give these cultures kind of a little uh, a fair shake so you can kind of understand. Some of these so if any of you do not have a um a tribe assigned to you then let me know but otherwise go ahead and um start working through those pages for the gradient question there is no photo which tribe are which tribe are you assigned, Peyton? Okay. Let me take a look. Oh yeah, look, sorry, we cannot find this image. Let me see if the rest of them are having that trouble. Oh, well, yep, it looks like the rest of you are having the trouble as well. Well, the image is not showing up, um, but please mention in the discussion whether you think that the people that you were assigned um, were seafaring or whether they were, um, you know, essentially coastal. Um, how tied were they to the coast? I don't think I'll be able to correct this in time for you guys to answer. A couple of you do have it, um, so you're welcome to answer. In the little tab, yeah, so it's it's going to be in a discussion. Um, so I think you can see my screen now. Yep, where you can hit reply. That's where you're going to have your responses. And this is a discussion with your with your group mates. I'm going to give you a couple more minutes, um, so please contribute to the discussion. Make sure you get your points.
Oh, so it's not updating um, with more recent posts. Interesting. That's good to know. What happens when you hit, um, William, what happens when you hit refresh? Are you able to see some newer, newer responses? Okay, great. It maybe it just takes takes a few seconds. That's good because Peyton, I think, was the most recent one. That's good. I appreciate you guys letting me know because, as I mentioned, the, this is a lot of new stuff, um, so I need to know how well this stuff works. Okay, so um, I think overall, um, the folks that had the Calusa people, and these are still open if you need to get some stuff in last minute. Um, the folks that had the Calusa people thought that they were pretty seagoing, I believe. Um, they lived in the Florida Everglades and relied on fishing and hunting rather than agriculture. So this is, Calusa people were quite a seagoing people, and they do appear in your, um, in your readings as well, quite heavily. The Temukua people, um, I think the feeling was that... Um, what do we think? Were they seagoing or land lovers? So I'm not seeing your answers here. Let me click responses. Okay, in the middle. So marsh loving, yeah, a, mar a marsh loving people essentially. Um, and then the Choctaw Nation. Um, I don't think any of you clicked on the image, but I think uh, most of the comments were about the culture. Did they do farming? Someone's typing now. Maybe not. Um, I didn't get a consensus for the Choctaw people. Um, the Chidi Macha people were quite uh, water loving, but maybe not so much as like, for instance, Vikings. So um, they would be a, you know, a, a beach or shore dwelling. The Choctaw people did do farming. I thought so as well. So, um, so they were a little bit more land loving. And then the Creek people, um, let's see what folks said about them. They were a combination of many cultures that were largely landlocked. So you can see even though these tribes were coastal, that doesn't necessarily mean they all relied on coastal resources, but there still were quite a few um, fairly unique, um, unique tribes in the region that were still kind of following the ways of their mound building ancestors and using those coastal resources. Last couple of slides before I end class for the day, I want to give you some context as to um, compare what we learned about the Gulf to other regions of the world. So let's compare to indigenous, indigenous Australians. Indigenous Australians were also seasonally nomadic and they returned to the same locations annually depending on the seasons. This is a similarity to um, what we've learned about mound building cultures. Um, they were also hunter-gatherers that relied heavily on fishing. However, hunting large birds and mammals was also very important, likely more so than ancient Gulf of Mexico cultures. Um, around 3000 to 1000 BC, their trade networks increased and their, their social structure became more complex. Like in the Gulf, they had different tribes brought together by seasonal or episodic abundance of resources. So these would have been, for instance, whale strandings, uh, migrations like eel migration or seal breeding season so they could hunt as a, as a large group. And there was cooperation between tribes for large scale hunting drives. And so this is not quite as um, consistent with what we know about the Gulf, but it still is a bunch of tribes coming together. There's also evidence for indigenous Australians of domestication of eels and very, very, very early aquaculture. And so this is an image of a 6,000 year old eel farm in Southern Australia. You can see they used rocks to build pens 
um, where they could grow and maintain eels for, for food consumption. So that's really cool. And then my last comparison is to early peoples of the Mediterranean basin. Um, so there were early hunter-gatherer groups in the region, about 12,000 to 5,500 uh, 5, BC. So these is really, really old cultures in this region. Um, these hunter-gatherer groups relied almost entirely on terrestrial game. And so these were not really seafaring people. However, the hunter-gatherer society in the Mediterranean basin was repeatedly colonized by a seafaring culture of farmers. And so these farmers were seafaring, um, however, they were farmers, and so they didn't really rely on fishing so much. They instead domesticated goats, sheep, pig, and cattle, and this was about from 8,000 to 5,000 BC. And the early hunter-gatherers largely adopted aspects of the farming way of life from their um, very early colonizers. So these are a lot of differences from the Gulf of Mexico. First of all, they're not relying on the coast. Um, that's probably the biggest difference. And so why is there such an extreme difference? Uh, the main reason is that the Mediterranean is not as productive as the Gulf of Mexico. So it's a semi-enclosed, um, something called an oligotrophic sea. So oligotrophic is an environment that's low in nutrients that can offer little to, to sustain life. So it's likely there just weren't enough coastal resources in that area to make something like, um, you know, sea dwelling or coastal subsistence a suitable way of life. Farming had to happen. This image here is kind of interesting. It's showing you locations of Mediterranean farming communities. The red shading represents areas that were colonized by the seagoing farming, um, farming culture. The green shading represents areas, areas where the original hunter-gatherer societies adopted some of that farming. And the blue areas are areas where farmers and hunter-gatherers were, um, they, they lived together, but they were separately. So they, they were in contact socially, um, but they didn't really share ways of life. So it's kind of interesting they're able to find that much out about how different cultures kind of clashed and uh, meshed a little bit in that region. Sorry, I'm one minute late, but I wanted to get through that because I thought it was pretty interesting. And um, I will see you on Monday. Have a great weekend.